Have you ever stopped to think that some of the greatest geniuses in history have been almost completely forgotten? Imagine a mathematician who paved the way for Gauss and Riemann, but whom almost no one remembers the name. Today, you'll discover the life and legacy of Dirichlet, one of the greatest brains in mathematics whose ideas changed the course of science, but they were left aside by history. And by the end of this video, you'll understand why the world should remember Dirichlet as much as Einstein or Newton. The Greatest Mathematicians of All Time Episode 3 Johann Peter Gustav Lejeune Giriclay Lejeune Dirichlet is best known for his proof that in any arithmetic progression with a first term co-prime to the difference, there are infinite primes. He was born on February 13, 1805, in Durin, French Empire, now Germany, and died on May 5, 1859, in Gauteguin, Hanover. Lejeune Dirichlet's family came from the Belgian town of Dirichlet, where Dirichlet's grandfather lived. This explains the origin of its name, which comes from Lejeune de Dirichlet, which means young man from Dirichlet. Many details of the Dirichlet family are given in and where it is shown that the Dirichlets came from the Liège neighborhood of Belgium and not, as many have claimed, from France. His father was the postmaster of Durin, his hometown, situated halfway between Aachen and Cologne. Even before entering the Bonn Gymnasium in 1817, at the age of 12, he developed a passion for mathematics and spent his pocket money buying mathematics books. In the gymnasium, he was a model student, being an exceptionally attentive and well-behaved student who was particularly interested in history and mathematics. After two years at the Bonn Gymnasium, his parents decided that they would prefer him to attend the Jesuit College in Cologne, where he was fortunate enough to be taught by Ohm. At the age of 16, Dirichlet completed his studies and was ready to enter university. However, the standards in German universities were not high at the time, so Dirichlet decided to study in Paris. It's interesting to note that a few years later, the standards in German universities would become the best in the world, and Dirichlet himself contributed to this transformation. Dirichlet left for France, taking with him Gauss's Disquisitionis Arithmeticae, a work that he cherished and kept constantly with him, as others would do with the Bible. In Paris, in May 1822, Dirichlet soon contracted smallpox. This did not keep him away from his classes at the Collège de France and the Faculté des Sciences for long and he was soon able to return to class. He had some of the leading mathematicians as teachers and was able to profit greatly from the experience of coming into contact with Biot, Fourier, Francoeur, Hachette, Laplace, Lacroix, Legendre, and Poisson. From the summer of 1823, Dirichlet was employed by General Maximilien Sebastian Foy, living in his house in Paris. General Foy had been an important figure in the army during the Napoleonic Wars, retiring after Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo. In 1819, he was elected to the House of Representatives, where he was leader of the liberal opposition until his death. Dirichlet was treated very well by General Foy, paid well, and treated like a member of the family. In return, Dirichlet taught General Foy's wife and children German. Dirichlet's first article would bring him instant fame as it dealt with the famous Fermat's Last Theorem. On 28 November 1825, General Foy died and Dirichlet decided to return to Germany. He was encouraged in this by Alexander von Humboldt, who made recommendations on his behalf. There was a problem for Dirichlet, because to teach at a German university he needed a qualification. Although Dirichlet could easily submit a habilitation thesis, this was not allowed as he did not have a doctorate, nor could he speak Latin, a requirement in the early 19th century. 
the problem was well solved by the University of Cologne, giving Dirichlet an honorary doctorate, thus allowing him to present his habilitation thesis on polynomials with a special class of prime divisors to the University of Breslau. There was, however, much controversy over Dirichlet's appointment. From 1827, Dirichlet taught in Breslau, but encountered the same problem that made him choose Paris for his own education, the low standards of the university. Again, with von Humboldt's help, he moved to Berlin in 1828, where he was appointed to the military college. The military college was not the attraction, of course. Instead, Dirichlet had an agreement that he could teach at the University of Berlin. Soon after this, he was appointed professor at the University of Berlin, where he remained from 1828 to 1855. He retained his position at the military college, which made his teaching and other administrative tasks somewhat heavier than he would have liked. Dirichlet was appointed to the Berlin Academy in 1831, and a better salary from the university put him in a position to marry, and he married Rebecca Mendelssohn, one of the two sisters of composer Felix Mendelssohn. Dirichlet had a longtime friend in Jacobi, who taught at Konigsberg, and the two exerted considerable influence on each other in his research into number theory. In 1843, Jacobi fell ill and was diagnosed with diabetes. His doctor advised him to spend time in Italy, where the weather would help him recover. However, Jacobi was not a wealthy man, and Dirichlet, after visiting him and discovering his situation, wrote to Alexander von Humboldt, asking him to help him obtain some financial aid for Jacobi from Friedrich Wilhelm IV. Dirichlet obtained leave from Berlin for 18 months and in the autumn of 1843 set out for Italy with Jacobi and Borchardt. After stopping in several cities and attending a mathematical meeting in Lucca, they arrived in Rome on 16 November 1843. Schlavely and Steiner were also with them, Schlavely's main task being to act as his interpreter, but he studied mathematics with Dirichlet as his tutor. Dirichlet did not remain in Rome for the entire period, but visited Sicily and then spent the winter of 1844-45 in Florence before returning to Berlin in the spring of 1845. Dirichlet had a high teaching load at the University of Berlin and was also obliged to teach at the military college, and in 1853 he complained in a letter to his pupil Kronecker that he had 13 lessons a week to give in addition to many other tasks. It was therefore a relief when, after Gauss's death in 1855, he was offered his professorship at Göttingen. Dirichlet did not accept Göttingen's offer immediately but used it to try to get better terms in Berlin. He petitioned the Prussian Ministry of Culture to allow him to stop teaching at the military college. However, he did not receive a quick response to his modest request, so he wrote to Göttingen accepting the offer of the Gauss chair. After he accepted Göttingen's offer, the Prussian Ministry of Culture tried to offer him better terms and salary, but this came too late. The quieter life in Göttingen seemed suited to Dirichlet. He had more time for research and some exceptional research students. However, unfortunately, he would not enjoy the new life for long. In the summer of 1858, he gave a lecture at a conference in Montreux, but while in the Swiss city, he suffered a heart attack. He returned to Göttingen with the greatest difficulty and while seriously ill, had the added sadness that his wife died of a stroke. We must now look at Dirichlet's remarkable contributions to mathematics. We have already commented on his contributions to Fermat's last theorem made in 1825. Around this time, he also published a paper inspired by Gauss's work on the law of biquadratic reciprocity. He proved in 1837 that in any arithmetic progression with first term co-prime to difference, there are infinitely many primes. This had been conjectured by Legendre. Davenport wrote in 1967, 
analytic number theory may be said to have begun with Dirichlet's work and in particular with Dirichlet's 1837 memoirs on the existence of primes in a given arithmetic progression. Soon after the publication of this paper, Dirichlet published two more papers on analytic number theory, one in 1838 and the next the following year. These papers introduced the Dirichlet series and determine, among other things, the formula for the class number for quadratic forms. His work on units in algebraic number theory, Explanations of Number Theory, published in 1863, contains important work on ideals. He also proposed in 1837 the modern definition of function. If a variable y is so closely related to a variable x that whenever a numerical value is assigned to x, there is a rule according to which a single value of y is determined, then y is considered a function of the independent variable x. In mechanics, he investigated systems equilibrium and potential theory. These investigations began in 1839 with papers that provided methods for evaluating multiple integrals and he applied this to the problem of the gravitational attraction of an ellipsoid at both internal and external points. He turned to Laplace's problem of proving the stability of the solar system and produced an analysis that avoided the problem of using expansion in series with quadratic and superior terms disregarded. This work led him to Dirichlet's problem about harmonic functions with given boundary conditions. Some work on mechanics later in his career is of great importance. In 1852, he studied the problem of a sphere placed in an incompressible fluid becoming, in the course of that investigation, the first person to integrate the hydrodynamic equations exactly. Dirichlet is also well known for his papers on conditions for the convergence of trigonometric series and the use of the series to represent arbitrary functions. These series had previously been used by Fourier in solving differential equations. Dirichlet's work was published in Krull's diary in 1828. Poisson's previous work on the convergence of Fourier series was demonstrated by Cauchy to be inrigorous. Cauchy's own work has been shown to be incorrect by Dirichlet, who wrote about Cauchy's paper. The author of this work himself admits that his proof is defective for certain functions for which convergence is nevertheless incontestable. Because of this work, Dirich Ley is considered the founder of the theory of Fourier series. Riemann, who was a student of Dirich Ley, wrote in the introduction to his habilitation thesis on Fourier series that it was Dirich Ley who wrote the first profound paper on the subject. In summary, Dirich Ley's character and teaching qualities are summarized as follows. He was an excellent teacher always expressing himself with great clarity. His manner was modest. In his later years, he was shy and sometimes reserved. He rarely spoke at meetings and was reluctant to make public appearances. At the age of 45, Dirich Ley was described by Thomas Hurst as follows. He is a tall, slender-looking man with a mustache and beard about to turn gray, a somewhat rough voice, and rather tone-deaf. It was Dirich Ley, with his cup of coffee and cigar. One of his defects is forgetting the time. He picks up his watch, discovers that it's past three, and runs off without even finishing the sentence. Koch summarizes Dirich Ley's contribution by writing that important parts of mathematics were influenced by Dirich Ley. His demonstrations, characteristically, began with surprisingly simple observations followed by an extremely accurate analysis of the remaining problem. With Dirichlet, the golden age of mathematics began in Berlin. Dirichlet may not be in school textbooks, but his discoveries are in every formula, in every theorem, and even in the foundations of modern mathematics.
He was the genius who set the stage for brilliant minds who came after. If this video showed you something new, don't let the knowledge die. Leave your like, share with someone who loves science, and subscribe to the channel to continue discovering the secrets that history has tried to hide. Because in the end, remembering these geniuses is keeping the flame of science alive.